Hi, this is Daryl from Crossroad of Truth on November 1st, 2021. Uh, the website is crossroadoftruth.org if you want copies of the notes or previous video recordings of the class. Um, we're finishing off Romans chapter three tonight. Uh, last week was the, the grand, uh, almost a mountain peak of the Bible that we dealt with in that passage, Romans 3, 21 through 26. And um, we spent uh, some great time in that last week. And tonight we're just gonna finish off that chapter and then end the class with uh, about uh, 45 minutes or so of we're gonna watch the Pilgrim's Progress together. And uh, I think you're gonna find that that movie uh, parallels a lot of the principles in Romans quite nicely. And I think that's a little bit of a hidden, uh, a uh, little, uh, you know, little known uh, secret actually about that book and that movie is, is probably one of the greatest ways um, to understand Romans from a practical standpoint. But anyway, I just want to take you back and just do a little recap, uh, very uh, just ad lib here of where we've come in these first three chapters. And I think this is class seven or eight, and you can know and you can see we've only got to the end of chapter three. So we really, this is a deep book, and it's and it's not going to lighten up. Uh, if we got another. The next four or five chapters is, is just as meaty as the last three. But let's uh, just go back to the theme of the book in, in chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. Just, to, just so we're reminded of the, the entire theme that Paul sets the stage uh, at the beginning. And it says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes, first the Jew, then the Gentile. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. And we've spent so much time going through righteousness and, you know, entire class is dedicated to this topic. I've never taught it in the depth that we've gone through it. So I really hope you um, learn from that. And if you forgot it, you should go through it again. These are, these are not simple concepts. Uh, they do require some study and repetition. So the notes are all on the website. Please download them and, and be able to explain this to other people. Um, now, right after Paul sets the theme, he gives us the bad news first. So Romans is, is, is the purest gospel. It's, it's, it's systematic theology. In the, and why that word is used is because he takes Bible precept and lays it on precept. And he builds a building uh, in a very logical fashion from the ground up. And of course, he has to start like any good preacher of the gospel would, with why we need the gospel. And that is because we are sinners. So he has to define how, how much of a sinner we are and, and bring us to a recognition and conviction uh, and an understanding of how important uh, sin is and, and, our, and our need to get, get rid of this sin. Get, we, we got this burden on our back, as the movie's going to show, and it's, it's all the sin accumulated in our life. And uh, man's greatest need is to get rid of that burden because the only way to achieve life in the eternal is to have our sin forgiven. This is the message of the Bible. Now, right, so he starts off in verse, in chapter one, verse 18, describing the wrath of God. And it says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. But these men suppress the truth. So that's what, so that's the, that's the theme of that chapter is the wrath of God and how it's revealed, why it's revealed, and in how it manifests itself in terms of uh, this progression of uh, de de depravity of man is just uh, uh, revealed to us. And then, then through chapter two, we talk about judgment, God's principles of judgment, and how all the world is guilty before God, Jew, Gentile, immoral. Um, it doesn't matter. Um, we're all guilty and, and therefore condemned under the condemnation of God. And just to, to skip forward in, in chapter eight, verse one, everyone should know this verse. Paul starts off, verse off says, um, and now there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. What a glorious statement to that great chapter, which we're going to get to soon. But you can see he's, you know, there's a bookend there, right? There's, we're under condemnation. We, we need a solution. In chapter three, we get the solution. And in chapter eight, Paul recaps it all saying, we're, there's, there's no condemnation. We, we are legally declared righteous. Um, by God in the courtyards of heaven when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Um, so uh, in chapter three, a couple of key verses that we, we already talked about, but just to remind you. Um, so the whole section from, from chapter one, verse 18 to chapter three uh, ends in verse uh, 19 uh, and 20. Uh, basically, it was says, uh, uh, hold on. 
Actually, I'll just read Romans 3.23. This is probably where it is. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So when he says that, so they basically declares, there's my verdict. There's the final verdict of God. Everyone has sinned. There's none righteous, no, not one. Uh, there's no one that can escape the wrath of God and the judgment of God. Except, but then we go on. Um, but now, in verse 21, the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of, G of Jesus Christ unto all upon that believe, for there is no difference. I'm just going to read this passage again. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare the righteousness for the remission of sins. Um, so there we see, we, last week we explained uh, what all that whole passage meant. And we, we talked about the word propitiation. This, this was the acceptable sacrifice to appease the wrath of God. And the propitiation, we said, is actually the mercy seat. Uh, in the Old Testament, the, the priest would have to pour the blood on the mercy seat and uh, to, to for, as an acceptable sacrifice uh, so God would forgive the sins of the nation. So Jesus came as the ultimate sacrifice um, from God. So when the Bible says, when Jesus says that, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And what Paul says is there's only one mediator between God and man, and that is Jesus Christ. And there's only one road, one door, and one propitiation. Um, the pre-existent creator of the universe, Jesus Christ, he, he was our propitiation. He provided the redemption that was set forth right back in Genesis 3 uh, when, when God made that first, uh, uh, when he declared war on Satan and said um, that, uh, you know, that the heel of the, of the Savior would, would crush the head of the serpent way back then. And so God's plan of redemption has been unfolding over the ages and it's still unfolding today uh, until we get to the end of this age. So that's kind of where we came. And uh, now I'm going to just uh, do a, finish uh, the last few verses of chapter three before we get going. Um, oh, uh, okay, sorry. Um, okay, uh, I'm just going to read verses 27 to 31. We're just going to spend five or 10 minutes on it. So right after he, he gives this uh, great gospel message, Paul says, where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what, by what law of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Seeing that it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and uncircumcision through faith. Do we make then void the law through faith? God forbid, yea, we establish the law. Okay, so um, this first topic uh, that we deal with in verse 27 is boasting is excluded. So this is a transitional passage. It points back to the prior argument that justification is conditioned on faith and not the works of the law or, or, the, or the, mo the, the Mosaic covenant. Uh, and it also looks forward to chapter four, which we're gonna deal with next week, which uh, Paul will take a whole chapter uh, to deal with Abraham and make the argument that Abraham too was accepted based on faith. And so just, uh, so just so you understand the context of how this is going, Paul gives this great theological explanation. Uh, really, it's the definitive text of the whole Bible in terms of what, uh, what, the sal what salvation really means in, in chapter three. But then that's not enough for him. He, now he want, and he's going to move on to examples using the greatest biblical uh, characters to prove his point, and he's going to use Abraham and David uh, in chapter four. Um, so this is why we're. This is I, I'm just giving you some context here. Um, so the next point: boasting or arrogance by the Jews of this era was quite common, both in their observing of the law, in their national pride, and in their three covenant markers, being circumcision, the Sabbath, and their diet. Um, so Paul is saying here, there is no one that can boast. In fact, you should be humble uh, and poor in spirit and thankfulness should be the response, not boasting about your works. And, and I would say that this is still uh, the problem of, of many people today, including many Christians. It is so tempting to rely on our what we do 
you know, how obedient we are. And we often start that process by comparing ourselves to others and they think, well, at least I'm not sinning like them. Uh, but anyway, we have nothing to boast about. This is the thing. It's not anything. This is what the whole Romans 3 was trying to teach. It's, it's not what we do. It's not about works. It's nothing we do. It's what Jesus has already done. It's his sacrifice uh, that, that accomplished everything. All we can do is put our faith in him and what he did for us. And so this is the major principle. And Paul is, is going to attack this works uh, based uh, theology extensively in this book of Romans and he does so justifiably so because it's it, this is the deception that basically most religions uh, believe that everything's by works whether it's you know Buddhism and karma you know it's what you do that's going to matter uh, a lot of Christians still think this way you know that faith uh, salvation is somehow um, it's going to be determined by their works the Catholics uh, a lot of them still believe this Paul just uh, argues this extensively that that is not the case. Um, boasting is not allowed because no one can follow the law perfectly to be accepted by God on judgment day. Um, the law stirs up disobedience, not obedience. The law stirs up pride. And the Jews boasted in being better than the Gentiles because they worshiped the one true God uh, and they had the law. Paul turns this argument upside down and says that the one true God is uniting all humankind the Gentiles too, based on justification by faith. Um, so the purpose of the law is to bring humanity to the realization that they fall short of the righteousness of God and thereby drive all people to the gospel. Now, I, I'm going to give you a, li a little bit of a Old Testament uh, covenant uh, theology here because it's very important. It's important as a Christian to understand this. And it's also important to understand the context of why Paul's using these arguments. And you have to understand the, the Jews you understood these covenants extremely well. And we all should too, actually. Uh, I think the, you know, a lot of churches have stopped teaching on these, but these covenants uh, are very important. So, and Paul sees these two covenants in tension and explains that the Abrahamic covenant actually anticipated the gospel. And this is what I, I said in chapter four, Paul's gonna prove this beyond a shadow of a doubt. But basically, uh, we have these two covenants, two, two major characters in the Old Testament that the Jews all looked up to as their, you know, Abraham was the father of the nation and Mose, uh, Moses was the, the bringer of the law and the redeemer from slavery of Egypt. These were the two heroes of the faith. And because of the, the, the law that Moses brought down, the Jews just assumed that the law, uh, that Abraham was actually saved by obeying um, God, right? And, and thereby by works, like the law. But Paul is going to prove that the Abrahamic covenant wasn't about the law at all, because it was before the law. And the Abraham covenant was based on faith of the individual of Abraham. And it was rooted in God's grace, and it was unconditional. And here's what that covenant said in a nutshell, uh, in, in, in case you uh, forget. This unconditional covenant was first made to Abraham in Genesis 12, 1 to 3, and it promised God's blessing upon Abraham to make his name great and to make his descendants into a great nation. The covenant also promised blessing to those who blessed Abraham and cursing, curse, cursing to those who cursed him. Further, God vowed to bless the entire world, i.e. Jews and Gentiles, um, through Abraham's seed, which would be Jesus Christ. Circumcision was the sign that Abraham believed the covenant, and the fulfillment of this covenant is seen in the history of Abraham's descendants and in the creation of the nation of Israel. Um, the worldwide blessing came through Jesus Christ, who was one of Abraham's family line. And uh, in the New Testament, it says that we are, we are of the seed of Abraham who put our faith in Jesus Christ. So as Christians, we are actually covered under this Abrahamic covenant. It is still alive today, and, and it will be until Jesus comes back. Now, the Mosaic covenant was based on the law of Moses, and this was rooted in individuals' works, and it was conditional. There was blessings based on response to the law. So this conditional covenant, this, some call it the Sinai covenant, because you got it on Mount Sinai, was found in Deuteronomy 11 and elsewhere, and it promised that the Israelites would receive a blessing for obedience and a curse for disobedience. Much of the Old Testament chronicles the fulfillment of this cycle of judgment for sin and later blessing when God's people repented and returned. Sacrifices and offerings were prescribed for sins, 
And the purpose of the law, says Paul, was to make people aware of their inability so that when Jesus Christ came, they would recognize their need for him. And the existence of the Mosaic Covenant is not a contradiction of God's grace, but instead an illumination of man's need for that grace. So uh, I'm just going to say, leave it at that for now. There's a good reference chart for you to come back to, and you should keep these covenants in mind in all your study, because um, you're going to find that you know every, every, a lot of things hinge on these covenants, as well as the Davidic covenant. So now, a summary of Romans 1 to 3, I, you know, two verses I think are kind of nice. If we go back to Jesus' words. Um, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So that, that most famous verse of the Bible really summarizes everything we've talked about up until now in Romans. It really does. When you really peel back um, all those precepts that Paul built up, you, you can unravel that single verse and get the same result. It's really quite amazing. And in John 3.36, uh, Jesus said, he who believes in the son has everlasting life. And he who does not believe the son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. So there's the wrath of God. Uh, even Jesus said that, that if you don't, if you're not in Christ, you are under the wrath of God, under condemnation. And, wh and what does Jesus say in these two verses? What, what the main purpose he came, to, what, what, what's, what's the main benefit of salvation and, and being forgiven of our sins? It's, it's life. It's eternal life. And when you really think about this, man's only need is life. The, the problem we have is we are all going to die. And only the Bible has the definitive um, result and outcome of what happens after death. And many people believe that, that there's something after death, but only Christians know exactly what, what, what it is. And there's heaven and there's hell. There's a judgment for those who have not chosen to believe in Christ. And uh, this is why this is the most important truth of the bible and um, of humanity and that's why it's so important to share this with people um so um hopefully after these first three chapters of romans you have now been convicted of your sin by the holy spirit you've admitted your utter wretchedness and decided to put your trust in jesus christ as your lord and savior if you did then you have now just been freed from the bondage of the sla of slavery in egypt and crossed the red sea into the wilderness be strong and courageous this journey is just beginning. Um, now, this chart here. Oh, sorry, I haven't had this. Uh, I've, I often show this chart in class. This will be the last slide before we start the movie. Um, and, uh, oh, just one second here. Uh, so, life is a spiritual journey, and for for all new Christians. Um, this is the journey that you will go on. And for, for those who have been Christians for some time, this is also the journey you are on, whether you knew it or not. This, this is you know, the pattern that Moses gave us um, when, he, when he brought the Hebrews out of Egypt is actually an example for us in our spiritual life today. And that's actually, that's what Paul says in, in the New Testament in, in a couple of areas, actually. So it's very important. This is why Egypt... Uh, is always um, mentioned in the Bible. And um, even Jesus, uh, the Bible always commands us to remember when God redeemed us from Egypt. But for us, it's, it's spirit, this is a spiritual metaphor. Now, Egypt represents the natural man uh, that Paul talks about in Corinthians. This is, this is the lost, unsaved person, which the Bible says, if you're, if you're unsaved, you are spiritually dead. You're in slavery and bondage, and you're condemned. And you're actually born in sin. We all are. Uh, but before you, if you're still in Egypt, the Bible says you cannot understand spiritual truths. Therefore, you're spiritually blind and you're spiritually deaf. And um, so this is where most of the world lives right now. And, and they don't even realize it. Um, now, when, when Moses took the, the Israelites or the Hebrews out of Egypt, uh, that was, uh, that was, he, he, was re he was, he redeemed them from the slavery, physical slavery. And, and those who are taking Mark with us have, have seen already I, uh, that Jesus has come in his sec first coming to redeem us from spiritual Egypt, uh, to redeem us from sin. So when, and then once we get out of Egypt, we, just like Jesus, will be, will be propelled into the wilderness for a time of testing and trials and temptations. This is the journey. And, and you cannot escape this. 
Um, so what, ha what happens when we're in the wilderness? We're saved. We've crossed the Red Sea. We're saved by faith in Jesus, but we're defeated by sin. This is, the, this is typically the backsliding Christian, wandering, victory sometimes, but also defeat. Sin is always at the problem. And, uh, and, and the sin of the uh, Israelites in the wilderness was, was primarily murmuring, which means complaining, not being thankful for God's blessings, uh, unbelief, and disobedience, just downright disobedience. When God told them, gave them the commandments, the first commandment was uh, to worship no other gods before me and no carved images. And what did they do? They made the they they made the uh, the golden calf almost immediately. Right? They they broke the sin of the law as soon as they they got it. Uh, um, but then finally, Joshua was able to take them over to the promised land. And this is where victory was achieved when they crossed the Jordan River. And spiritually speaking, this is Romans 8. The wilderness is really Romans 7. When we get to that, you're going to see there's this, there's this Christian journey that Paul takes and, just, and takes us on his journey. And he takes us through this terrible Romans 7, this valley of spiritual war and defeat and sin getting him at every turn. And he, and he cries at the end, oh, wretched man that I am, who can save me from this body of sin? And this was when Paul was saved, he was having these kind of battles. But in Romans 8, he reveals the secret to the spirit-filled life. And, uh, and that's really what we call the, the spiritual promised land, where we're living a victorious life filled with the Holy Spirit. Um, we're sanctified, what the Bible calls. And this is really about being right in the heart more than it is the head. Um, it's, uh, it's the outliving of the indwelling Christ. And the little principle I put on here is you just do the trusting and let God do the fighting. Keep your eyes on Jesus, just like Peter did on the boat. That's the key. Faith, faith is about the object we have our faith in. And the object is always Jesus Christ and his word and what he did for us on that cross. If we keep our eyes on Jesus, um, we, we will rise above the waves. And these four little requirements uh, we'll come back to in Romans 8, but uh, in, a, in a little cheat sheet fashion, uh, if you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit and receive and receive power over sin and power in your Christian service, uh, keep be right with God. Confession and renunciation. The first John 1 9. Do it every day or whenever you need to. Confess your sins and He's faithful and just to forgive you. As soon as you do that, uh, Jesus says you he's, He'll wash your feet and cleanse you of all unrighteousness and, and bring you into fellowship again with God. And the Holy Spirit will not be grieved, but come back alive in your heart. Um, obedience and dedication. Um, so they, that examples of that might be to, to do your Bible studies, uh, pray regularly and, and make sure there's no unforgiveness in your heart. Um, surrender and surrender in a practical sense means surrender your time, your money, yourself, as Jesus would say, deny yourself. And, uh, and of course, faith, uh, is, uh, is trusting in Jesus like a child. Um, and as don't fear, just believe. So this is a great little uh, cheat sheet for the spiritual journey. And now we're going to go to the movie and we're going to watch how uh, John Bunyan had great uh, anointing insight on this journey and how he interpreted the Bible in such a perfect way to write uh, the best-selling Christian book next to the Bible in the history of the world, The Pilgrim's Progress. And uh, this is on the website under Bible movies for those who... Um, are not going to be able to follow along. I am going to stop the recording now because I don't want this to be censored off of 